get busy on the 100th lesson in our studies in John. This is subtitled, The Work of the Holy Spirit. Very exciting night for me. I love any teaching and talking about the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer, in the life of the non-believer. We'll we're going to discuss both of those tonight because Jesus does talk about the Holy Spirit for the believer and the unbeliever in, in this passage. This is not the first entry of the Holy Spirit into the text. We've had Jesus speaking about the Holy Spirit off and on for several chapters. We've been dealing with these words in red for a while. We're right in smack in the middle of a long chunk of the words of red, but it's not really the start of the conversation. Jesus has been talking pretty extensively since at least chapter 13, back when he was washing their feet and they were celebrating communion. And we had that famous interchange between Jesus and Peter and then Jesus and his disciples. And we've, we've walked through all of these glorious things about the vine dressers and, and abiding. And, and now Jesus, who has introduced the person of the Holy Spirit, I said person, not on accident there, because I like to refer to the Holy Spirit as a he. I don't mean that gender-wise, but I mean that as an individual, not as an it. I don't believe the Holy Spirit is some sort of mystic, heavenly mist, um, some easily offended uh, emotional stimulus that happens in a service when people finally pray right, or you sing the correct song, and then everyone has sort of a community uh, it's almost like everyone uh, uh, finally gets on the same drug at the same time and then has some sort of communal experience. And we've treated the Holy Spirit that way far too often. He's easily triggered by songs he likes. He's easily turned off by stuff he doesn't like. He'll come into the room in a hurry and he'll leave just as quickly. He's easily, we've presented him almost as an it, the most easily offended member of the, of the Godhead. We've presented him as an inferior member of the Godhead as if he is on some levels at least a level below God and a level below Jesus. And that he's some sort of outside influence who sort of hangs out in your life and leads you if you'll let him, but leaves you alone if you, uh, if you don't spend enough time with him. I think these are all insults. The Holy Spirit is the invisible presence of who Jesus is. That's a very simple way to start. The Holy Spirit is not some cloud, something we have to achieve something and so that he approves us. Think of the Holy Spirit as Jesus absent in the physical body, but present with you. Paul said it this way, that the... The mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It, it wasn't beyond Paul to talk about the Holy Spirit, but how can Christ be in us, the hope of glory? Christ, the individual, we know it's not the individual, the physical Jesus. So what does he mean other than that indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit? We read the last two verses of John 15 last week, so I have a lot of ground to cover tonight. I'm already spending too much time talking, just introducing the Holy Spirit. So what I'm going to do is just read a chunk of Scripture, and then we're going to get, jump in and, and get to work on this work of the Holy Spirit. Let's read the last two verses of John 15, and then the first four verses of John 16. All right, John 15, 26. 26, 27 constitutes the end of the previous chapters, where we were last week. But as I said last week, I don't think it's a real good chapter break. Um, not worth splitting hairs over, but Jesus is taking you into a new thought and he doesn't just start doing that in chapter 16. So I think 26 might be a little bit better break. So let's take the last two from last week, then jump into a few from this week. But when the helper comes, helper is parakletos. This is the paraclete. This is the one who walks alongside. We, off, we also call this the comforter. We also call him the Holy Spirit. When the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, there's another title for the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, look at the role of the Holy Spirit. He will testify of me. So one of the first things Jesus tells us about the Holy Spirit is that he gives constant testimony. Testimony is a verbal witness. He gives a verbal witness towards who Jesus is. And so the role of the Holy Spirit cannot exclude who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. The Holy Spirit doesn't come in to be about me or to be about you. In my Pentecostal heritage, far too often the Holy Spirit was all about what we talked about in regards to the Holy Spirit had to do a whole lot more with emotion than it did with Jesus. It had to do with how we felt, what we did with it. It wasn't testifying of Jesus. And you would think there must be a verse somewhere in the Bible that says when the Holy Spirit comes, He will testify of you and how you ought to act. But there's not. 
That's the way the Holy Spirit's been presented. That verse isn't in the Word. And so instead, he testifies of Jesus because he's the spirit of truth. And you also will bear witness because you've been with me from the beginning. And pay attention to the pronoun you, second word of verse 27. Jesus is very specifically talking to the disciples. You guys have been with me. Therefore, you're going to witness of me. Same way the Holy Spirit will because you've been with me from the beginning. Now, chapter 16, then just one easy flow right out of that thought. So it's not like it's a new thing happening. It's a new chapter, but it's the same paragraph. These things I've spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. So I gave you this so that you'll be able to walk this out. They're going to put you out of the synagogues. And this is one of the rare moments in the John version of the gospel story that John speaks of, of something that would have happened sort of pre-AD 70 between the resurrection and ascension of Christ and the fall of the temple. The phrase synagogue is a very Jewish phrase. And so John's speaking of they're going to kick you out of the synagogues because this happened in the first generation church. As they begin to proclaim Jesus as Messiah, they begin to be booted out of their places of assembly. So the places that had accepted them before then begin to reject them. Those would have been Jewish synagogues. This is, that's not an anti-Semitic statement. It's a historical statement of fact of what happened in that hour. Um, they were not allowed to continue practicing the Judaism of their youth with this Messiah, Jesus, because there was that, those two things were diametrically opposed to one another. So that would happen in their lifetime. They're going to uh, put you out of the synagogue. The time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And that's a, that's a prophecy of Saul of Tarsus. One of the most stark examples of that happening is, is Saul who persecutes the church and does it in the name of God because he believes that he needs to keep Judaism pure of these factions of people who have begun to worship a criminal that... Uh, died a very ignoble death outside of Jerusalem. And almost an embarrassing, it's almost embarrassing to a Saul that he has to go suppress this, that his own brothers and sisters have fallen for this Jesus of Nazareth. So the prophecy that they're going to think they're doing God a favor happens almost immediately, within three years of the ascension. We have the, we have the uprise of someone like a Saul of Tarsus. And these things they will do to you because they've not known the Father nor have they known me, verse 4. But these things I've told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. So this is Jesus' way of saying there's a whole lot of things I left until this moment right before I leave because I wanted to equip you with relationship. I wanted to equip you with us being together. And so this overall theme had me thinking this way today. Due to the pointed nature of Jesus' words, that's why I want you to see the whole collection, six straight verses. He's not done talking, but I want you to see how they would have felt with all of that coming out of Jesus' mouth. Due to that pointed nature, the disciples saw the Spirit as something exclusive to them. All the you pronouns. They're going to kick you out of the synagogue. You guys are going to testify of me because you were with me. Who else was with him? Just us. No one else, just us. We're going to witness of him. What's he going to leave us in, on, in return? He's going to leave us the spirit of truth. He's going to give us what the Father gave him. And so there was this idea that the Holy Spirit was something exclusive to the people who had walked with Jesus. Now, Pentecost changes that. Because on the day of Pentecost, there's 120 of them gathered together. You, now, you might be saying, how could 120 of them be gathered if they thought 11 of them were going to be the ones that received the Holy Spirit? The 11 is a misnomer. There were not 11 people following Jesus. I say 11 because Judas is gone by this point. So I've subtracted one over. There's not only 11 people following Jesus. There are a lot of people following Jesus. And there's evidence that there was an enormous amount of people at time following Jesus. And mostly women following Jesus. The, the early church, you cannot, you cannot mask or cover up the contribution of women in the message of the early church from the tomb all the way through. Not only does Paul list apostles by name, um, but one of our most famous early couples, Priscilla and Aquila, who will lead Apollos into Christianity out of Judaism, the woman's name is listed first for one of the rare moments. It's almost as if you can see a, a, coin, a, a new leaf turning over in the New Testament. Um, 
And so there's an enormous crowd. Why, where did I get, why am I on that? Because when you get to Pentecost, there's, there's 10 times more people waiting in that upper room at Pentecost than there is this moment when Jesus is alone with his disciples. Um, so, but it's still at Pentecost, basically the people that ran around with Jesus, 120 of them, because they believed that the Holy Spirit was basically exclusive to them. What happens at Pentecost? Holy Spirit shows up. Same Holy Spirit Jesus told them was coming in, in John 15. And when the Holy Spirit comes in, he comes in as a rushing mighty wind. Cloven tongues as a fire sits on their head. They all begin to speak with other tongues. Peter begins to preach. And as he preaches, 3,000 people believe on Jesus and receive Christ. The great conversion that, that flips the script on Sinai. The laws given at Sinai, 3,000 people die. The Holy Spirit is given at Pentecost. 3,000 people are saved. So the entrance of the new covenant is this brand new experience. And boom, outside of the, this circle, 3,000 people receive Christ and start receiving the same Holy Spirit they have. So Pentecost shows them Jews are included. Oh, so, oh it's not just us that ran around with Jesus. And then Peter's eating lunch on his, or about to eat lunch on the roof of his house one day, and the Holy Spirit comes to him, and you know the story. Here comes that, that uh, sheet full of unclean animals, and the Holy Spirit says, take, kill, and eat. And Peter says, I don't eat anything unclean. And then God speaks to him, and he has a revelation. In Acts 10, he goes to the house of Cornelius, an Italian, a Gentile. He's not a Jew. He's praying to the Jewish God, but he's, he's not a Jew by birth. And Peter goes to his house under instruction of the Holy Spirit. Doesn't even know why he's there. He doesn't go to witness. He knocks on the door and says, hey, I'm here because the Lord said, come. I don't know what I'm doing. Why am I here? And they begin to ask for the gospel. And Peter shares the gospel. And as Peter shares the gospel, the Holy Spirit comes in. Cornelius' house showed them that Gentiles were eligible as well. And so although there's these pronoun-specific moments in John 15, 16... They took them to believe the Holy Spirit belongs to us. At Pentecost, they went, okay, well, the Holy Spirit belongs to the people of God. Oh, wait a minute. The Holy Spirit belongs to more than that. God wants to do something. I say this to you because as a student of the Bible, you're reading these, watching these pronoun specific moments of Jesus speaking to his disciples. And it might be easy for you to say, well, I don't know if he's left us with the same Holy Spirit that he left with Peter, James, and John. It's maybe not the same thing that we're experiencing. And yet at every outpouring, at every overflow of the Spirit out of those, those specified fences into the just us, now it's Jew, Jews. Oh, now it's Italians, Gentiles. At every overflow, it's the same Holy Spirit. The disciples never give this, this idea that, oh, it's a diluted version. They don't have what we had. No, Peter, in fact, at the council in Jerusalem in Acts 15 goes, they got the same thing. He even uses this phrase. They received the same Holy Spirit we did. In other words, there's not been any dilution. What other thing can you, can you multiply? And the fourth and fifth product is as powerful as the first. And yet the early church gets that revelation that the more God multiplies this, it's just as powerful. Now you're 2,000 years later. So generations of the overflow of the Holy Spirit, generations of one generation and the next generation and the next generation, it's easy to come under the illusion that we somehow have a lesser form of the power than the early church had or than the, the, than the original disciples had. And I think that nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, because if it's a diluted version, then the dilution has to be on the part of the giver, not the receiver then the problem is the fault of God, not us. And I don't want to be the one that says, hey God, I think you're giving us a faulty version of the Holy Spirit because we don't have what Peter, James, and John have. I think the opposite is true. I think we have exactly what they had because we have the same person. It's not some diluted version of something. It's the person of the Holy Spirit and we have received that in who we are. And that leads me to this thought. We tend to start the journey with exclusions. So when we get on this road of salvation, we sort of have exclusions about who gets it and who doesn't. This is sort of this is kind of like our baseline spiritual immaturity. We come to Christ uh, whatever that looks like because a lot of people come into Christianity without much of a revelation, let's be honest. Right? 
maybe I'm alone. I, I came into Christianity without much of a revelation. I'm just a little kid, didn't want to go to hell. All right? Um, didn't, didn't know didn't know anything about relationship, didn't understand revelation of, of love, and a lot of that stuff took decades, decades to really come into. And so uh, my level of maturity on that as I grow, I, admittedly, was pretty exclusive. I had the Holy Spirit in a pretty small box. And as I went into life and ministry, the box didn't get a whole lot bigger. You, you're going to get him. You're going to get him a certain way. You're going to have to be doing a certain thing. Um, trust me, when this thing's all over with, you're going to see how many people aren't even saved. A uh, bunch of people that think they're right with God aren't right with God. Very exclusive message. Uh, I've, and that does, by the way, that doesn't have anything to do with age because I've seen guys twice my age that still have a really small box for the Holy Spirit. All right? Age doesn't matter. I mean, you can have gray hair and still have the smallest box of who can get into heaven. So age doesn't, doesn't matter at all about how old you are. Although it is, it, it's very like... Um, it's very like an immature young man's theology to think he's got something figured out. Then to stay in that is insane. It's because we're not walking into a fuller revelation. So we start with exclusion, which is kind of like who doesn't belong. Those are exclusions. And as we grow in revelation of his love, those parameters expand, as does our embrace. Now, I shied away from using what should have been the pure opposite of exclusion. As we grow in revelation of his love, the parameters expand, as does, I said, our embrace. Whereas I probably should have said, where does our inclusion? Because that's the, that's the opposite of exclusion. Now, I didn't, and I'm going to tell you why. One reason I didn't do it is because I don't think it carries the weight of embrace. Because embrace denotes relationship, and it denotes willingness. I willing... If I put my arms around you, I put my arms around you. There's nothing that forces me to do that. If you're included in what I do, I might have had that forced upon me. And so I think rather than Christianity is inclusive, fine, we, we are embracing that which we used to exclude. It's you that has to do it. Because the Holy Spirit's never had an embracing problem. We have. Let me, let me clarify that. The Holy Spirit's never had a problem bringing people in, loving people. Any problem with loving people and bringing them in, that's our issues. That's not the Holy Spirit's issues. He's cool with, with embracing people. The other reason I didn't use inclusion is because people have created a subset in the message of grace called the doctrine of inclusion. And all they want to do is fight about whether or not everybody is mandatory included in the finished work of Christ or voluntarily included in the finished work of Christ. And you'll get, in, you'll get on message boards, and that is a rabbit hole you will never get out of. And you will have scriptures thrown at you from every angle about whether people are included because Jesus died and rose again, or whether people are not included when Jesus died and rose again, and whether there's anything you can do about it. Mm, okay, we'll leave that alone. So I'm not about trying to get to the bottom of that. But I do believe that we start out excluding and we end up embracing. And the more we revel in that love, the more we start to embrace. How do I know this? What did Jesus say to his disciples? I'm, the Holy Spirit's going to come, Acts chapter 1. He said, the Holy Spirit's going to come. He's going to do you with power from on high. And you're going to be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. And I'm doing my little parameters. Watch the box get bigger. You're going you're to witness in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. What was Jesus trying to say? It's not geographic. What Jesus was trying to say is, right now, guys, it's me, you, and a little box. You think you've got it all, but I'm, your mind's about to be blown. Because once the Holy Spirit comes in, what you're going to realize is that the Holy Spirit overflows every parameter you put on the Holy Spirit. So it's not just Jerusalem, it's Judea. And then it's not just Judea, it's Samaria. And it's not just Samaria, it's Rome. And it's not just Rome, it's the barbarians out at the edge of the empire. And it's not just the barbarians at the edge of the empire, it's the people you haven't met yet on the other side of the world. And... and I will embrace them all through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Jesus is telling them. All right, let's do a few specific verses. John 16, 2, they'll put you out of the synagogues. The time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God a service. I actually slowed down and worked through these a little earlier, so I'm not going to do that again. We'll just read through them. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. Man, that's true, by the way. Verse 3, you didn't say much about this earlier. What happens in... In opposition 
is always going to be from people that don't walk in relationship with God as a father. Don't spend any time arguing with other Christians who see God as a master. Okay? Because you're only going to be frustrated because they're reading a different, they're reading the Bible through a different set of eyes than you are. That's a fact. When they read it, they see a taskmaster God that you need to live up to, and they can't understand what you're talking about. You're laying verses out there about the fatherhood of God. They're, they're jumping right past it to go to a verse they think is superior. Because I know from experience, there are people who think that there are verses that carry more weight than other verses. So it doesn't matter how many, how many verses you stack up about relationship or about the Father. They've already got two or three handy dandy missiles that they're going to use to try to shoot down that version of relationship. Plus, they've already segmented that version of Jesus off into a part, of, a part and parcel of people they don't want to belong to. This is why it's dangerous for us to jump in our camps. Ideological camps, sociological camps, political camps, they're dangerous. Because what happens is once you get into an ideology, into a society, into a politic, and then anything comes at you that's dissenting to what the group believes, even if you know that what's coming at you is valuable, you're forced to reject it to remain in the camp. And what that does is it shuts you off from truth. And that's what's happening to a lot of people about relationship. Because they have the God part down, but then you, they've already ensconced themselves as an enemy of other things. Maybe an enemy of another doctrine, an enemy of another denomination, an enemy of an idea, an enemy of a movement, an enemy of a message. And so when any truth comes out and tries to penetrate the heart, they go, well, that sounds great. They bring that back to their group. You know what their group says? Oh, you sound like one of those grace people. And that's as insulting as if you're a Republican in your group and you bring back an idea and your group goes, what are you, a liberal? And then you kick that idea out because you can't possibly believe anything that falls outside of your ideology, lest it make your ideology weaken or crumble. That's a dangerous place to be. And God and, and Jesus comes to knock those things down so that we can receive the truth of the Holy Spirit. That's what I mean by he keeps flowing over walls as well. He keeps jumping over those ideological walls to just keep knocking down the strictures and structures we put into place that help define how we feel or, how, or what we believe in. And so when Jesus says, here's why they're not going to like you, because they don't know the Father. He doesn't say they don't know God. They're in synagogue. They're kicking them out of church. But for the most part, that's the word we would use. Not the word they used, but they're kicking them out of church. And you go, why would you get kicked out of church? Because they don't know the Father. They go, well, wouldn't they want to know the Father? Maybe if they could get out of their ideology and get out of their box. But as long as they're in that box, Father looks like those crazy psychos way out here on the other, in the other version of Christianity. And we can't take that in because then what will we look like? And so was, that's always an issue. And how are we going to guard against that? We're going to have to be proactive. We're going to have to be diligent. I don't mean we're working for our salvation. I mean we're working inside of it. You want to work out what God's working in you? Then pay attention to what God's working so that you can work it out. And then, man, what a difference. What an influence that begins to make in our lives. All right. Man, oh, no. These things I do because I, they know my Father. These things I've told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. Let's read two more, five and six. But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you ask me where you're going. Look at that phrase. I'm going away to him who sent me, and none of you ask me where are you going. But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Next screen. They actually have asked. Remember? Peter asked him at the end of chapter 13. He said, Lord, where are you going? He literally says it that way. Lord, where are you going? And Jesus says, where I'm going, you can't go with me now. And Peter goes, yeah, I can. In fact, I'll go all the way to death with you. And Jesus goes, no, you won't. Before the rooster crows twice, you'll deny me three times. So they actually did ask him. They actually asked him. Peter did. And then Thomas does, the beginning of 14. I'm going to my father. And Thomas goes, Lord, how can we know where you're going? How can we know the way you're going? We don't even know where you're going. Remember that encounter? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. 
Jesus is implying something much deeper. This isn't a contradiction of text. Look deep inside the context. Jesus is implying this. You haven't bothered to really understand where I'm going because you've given in to sorrow. And this is the truth I take from that. The great challenge of humanity is understanding. The easy part of humanity is emotion. You see, they haven't slowed down long enough to ask the right questions because they're so torn up with emotion. None of them's even saying, can you just really explain to me what you're about to do? None. Jesus goes, none of you have stopped and asked me what I'm really about to do. How is it that none of you have stopped to ask what I'm really about to do? You know why you haven't stopped? Because all you're doing is filled with sorrow. You've been so overwhelmed with emotion that you haven't went deeper. And so I wrestle with that. I go, what's the principle I'm supposed to take away with that from that? And what I get is that the great challenge of being human is understanding my brother and understanding my enemy and understanding my neighbor. It's the great challenge. You know what the easy part of being human is? Just reacting. That's simple. You just do whatever you want. You just react to however you feel. One of the great travesties that's been pitched at our young people is live how you feel. No, don't ever just live how you feel. If you live how you feel, you might invite chaos and hell into your life. If you only live to your emotion, you do whatever your emotion tells you to do. You are in for a life of pain. Humanity is not about giving in to the easiest emotion. Humanity is the opposite. It's taking your emotions and setting them aside so that you can understand people you're emotional about. So you can ask yourself why I love that person. What is it about them that I love? So that you can equally ask, what is it about them I don't like? What is it about them I don't understand? Why am I not embracing them? Why do I naturally exclude them? Is the problem me? Is the problem my thinking? Maybe the problem is something else, but the reality is, is I can't fix something else. But I might be able to do something with me. You better always hope, by the way, that whatever you're going through, I know this sounds, this is so odd to, for, for Christians to really think about, but you better hope that whatever issue you're going through in life is you. Every encounter that goes, goes sideways, hope you're the fault. Because the reality is, is you can't do anything about it any other way. If it's them, you can't fix it. If it's the world, you can't fix it. You better hope it's you. Because if it's you, that's the one person in the circle you can work on. And you go like, you go face the world and go, man, I don't know what I'm going to do. I got problems. You go, what do you think the problem is? Well, I hope the problem's me. You should hope the problem is you. Because if the problem's not you, there's nothing you can do about the other problems. And so a lot... Take whatever that is and use it to be understanding. Understand you, understand her. I put a little post up this week, basically it was kind of playing off of this. Basically said, judgment is easy, understanding is hard. Um, that's this line really in reverse. Um, basically that the great challenge is to understand. That's the hard part. But... I said judgment is, is easy. I think emotion is easy. That's why emotion is so easy to judge people. So you can look at everybody and go, well, I know what her problem is. You don't even understand her, but you already got her problems figured out. But that didn't take much, did it? It would took a lot longer to understand. And that, in my humble opinion, is the discourse we lack in the American political arena, in the American media, is that everyone has an emotion, everyone is quick to tell you what they think, and almost no one does the very hard work of understanding why other people don't think like them. And that is hard work, and it's not fun. And it's, it's so not fun that it's just easier to give in to the emotion. And just, like, I, I mean, in this hour, don't you really want to know what, wouldn't you love to know what people think about masks? <laughs> Like, like, man, I, I, wouldn't you love to know? 
what people, it's easy to hear. It's, that's an easy one to hear what people think. But it's a lot harder if you're hardcore wear one, hardcore don't wear one. That's easy. That doesn't take anything to be hardcore. But it's a lot harder to understand why the other person is so hardcore. That is not as easy to do. And I used the most common example I could come up with that everybody would get. Go way past mask wearing and make that a reality in your life to things that truly matter. And watch how, how interesting that becomes. John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. Because if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Just stare at that for a second. I want you to think about the improbability of that first sentence. Imagine that you're Peter, James, and John standing next to Jesus. And Jesus says, you know what? I'm going to tell you guys the truth. It's to your advantage that I disappear. And if I'm Peter, James, and John, I think I say, look, I know you think you're telling me the truth. <laughs> But I don't think this is truth. There's no way this is truth that is to my advantage. Jesus assumed that humanity... Now, I want you to catch my word. I use that very tongue-in-cheek, okay? I'm going to ask you a question here that's kind of sacrilegious on this, on this screen, but that's all right. You, we, you know my heart. It's got to ask the tough questions to get the right answers. Jesus assumed that humanity would be better off with the indwelling Holy Spirit than they, than they are with the physical Son of God? Think about that question. Jesus makes an assumption that you would be better off if I got out of the way so you could have the Holy Spirit. That's a huge assumption. And on the face, he's dead wrong. At least that's how the church has preached it. For a couple thousand years, here's how we've preached it. Man, it's all right now, but it's going to be so much better when I get to see Jesus face to face. And Jesus said the opposite. Jesus said it would be better for you guys if you stopped seeing me face to face because you have no idea what's going to happen to you. When the spirit of truth directly from my father deposits himself into your heart. Now, I don't think the disciples argued with him. They had never had reason to believe Jesus was lying. So I want to take the opposite tact. Instead of Peter, James, and John going, nah, you're full of it, man. We're not better. I think they got excited and went, you got to be kidding. If it's this good with him here, I don't know what this spirit of truth looks like. I don't know what this spirit of truth feels like, but I can't wait to get some. And that's what drove them for 10 days in the upper room to stay in that room. Because they went, Jesus said this is better. I got to get whatever is better. I got to have some of that. So why do we seem disappointed? Was Jesus wrong? Well, you know the answer. Jesus is never wrong. So that takes care of that. But our understanding of what the role of the Holy Spirit is is what's caused us so much grief. It's what's caused us to look at texts like this and say, hmm, I don't really get that, that Jesus being gone would, would give me more of a presence than I had with Jesus here. But I want that to be the big challenge, one of the big takeaways for you tonight is that you leave this room and start to dwell on the idea that Jesus has released something into the church that has the same force of what the Father released into Him at the Jordan, 
when the Holy Spirit lighted upon Jesus and God said, this is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. One of the great insults that we have in the church against the Holy Spirit is this idea that we are saved, lost, saved, lost, saved, lost, saved, lost. I sin too much, now I'm lost. We are insulting the Spirit of the Lord that descended upon Jesus like a dove and God sat on his shoulder and said, this is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. Jesus turns to his disciples and says, I'm gonna give you exactly what dad gave me. I've never once looked at my dad and questioned whether or not I was his son. So don't you ever look at God and question whether you are his son or daughter. Don't do insult to the power and presence of the Holy Spirit that is inside of you. And, and with this remarkable, and, and this, this I think, the reality is I, I don't know that I, 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 I bit off a lot to try to get through the rest of this lesson. Because, um, I mean, I'm, in my notes, we get all the way through he who judges the, sin, the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. We're not even there yet. So just let me slow down because I've actually tried to speed up here the last few minutes to get to it. And I, I don't, I don't want to do that because I think there's some couple things we could say right here to do real justice to this. So we might just have to do more next week. Um, I've been thinking a lot lately about our obsession. It's the wrong word. Um, let me start over. I spent a lot of time when I first was in ministry, when I first started preaching, probably at least the first dozen, 15 years, really in a, a mostly in Pentecostal charismatic churches. A lot of denominational churches, a lot of non-denominational churches, but mostly Pentecostal charismatic. There was a lot of teaching and preaching on the Holy Spirit. Now, we almost always called him the Holy Ghost. Same character. But we, we highly attached him to emotion. We highly attached him to conviction. We highly attached him to holiness. And almost everything he did was external in one way or the other. It was almost as if he started on the outside and worked his way to the inside, which seems like the opposite message of redemption. Because the opposite of the, the, the new covenant is to start in here with transformation that blossoms and then comes out. Um, but we taught the Holy Spirit almost the opposite. It was almost as if the Holy Spirit's going to get on you and then the Holy Spirit's going to get in you. You know, it was like, it was like you're going to get this thing on you like a mantle. And then that's just going to seep down into who you are. And then that's going to come out of your mouth. And that's going to come out in your actions. Um, so I heard, I heard the statement the other day that reminded me so much of what I have said 5,000 times. And when I heard it, it, it just hit my spirit sideways. And I haven't stopped thinking about it in, in some ways since. Um, it really was timely. I think it's why I heard it because of what lesson I'm teaching. And the statement was made innocently and, and, and I know the person that said it and they're beautiful spirit and I love them to death, but it just hit me. Uh, they said, if we could just really get people to understand the Holy Spirit that they have inside of them, man, we'd start to see signs, wonders, and miracles in the church. We'd start to see these things happening like was happening in the book of Acts. And it kind of hit me sideways, and I, and I kind of wondered at first why it hit me sideways, because I thought, man, I've said that. I've said that thousands of times, and I don't disagree with the statement, that, but I think where I am in the journey is I have stopped focusing on the external response of the Holy Spirit and started focusing on the relationship in my heart with the person of the Holy Spirit, the man Christ Jesus, so much that I think why it kind of hit me crossways was I, I sometimes think we're expecting the wrong things out of the Holy Spirit. I think we're so infatuated with, with seeing Him do something in the natural that we're a whole lot like the children of Israel in the wilderness. I've been reading more of the Old Testament lately. And one of the things that strikes me is that Israel always had to have God showing out. Every time they turned around, they demanded God show out physically. You better do, they wanted him to do that with rocks and do that with water and part seas and knock stuff down and blow stuff over. 
the greatest revelation of the Old Testament that almost never gets talked about, by the way, the greatest revelation of the Old Testament is Elijah sitting in a cave and fire and earthquakes and storms happen and he realizes that God's not in any of them. Think about that. That's the great revelation. Because all they had ever thought about God was how he could knock stuff over. And Elijah needed to shake that image of God. And so here comes a still small voice. And that's how we used to preach that. But I tell you what, sometimes he's just in the still small. You know what the Holy Spirit was doing there? He was trying to introduce you to the wonderful beauty of the communicative relationship you could have with the Father if you'd get your eyes off of mountains falling over and seas parting and stuff happening. I think we've gotten so obsessed with feeling as if the true presence of the Holy Spirit is signs, wonders, and miracles. And I think Jesus' heart was always relationship. So I've been wrestling with that for days. And it, it struck me yesterday that Jesus doesn't say, come unto me, all you who are sick and diseased, and I will give you healing. He says, come unto me, all you who labor under heavy laden, I will give you rest. And do you know why the words of Jesus fell on deaf ears? Because it's not as exciting to come to Jesus and have him do the invisible as it would be to come to Jesus and have him do the visible. And that's why the morning after he fed the 5,000, he says to the crowd that comes back, you didn't come back to hear me. You came back for me to do another miracle, didn't you? He goes, but I tell you the truth. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have any part in me. Get that? Unless you consume who I am, all you're ever going to look for is what I can do. So I think one of the reasons why we are not seeing a true revelation of the Holy Spirit in the church is because we missed Jesus' intent in giving people the Holy Spirit. The intent of the Holy Spirit was not to knock stuff over. The intent of the Holy Spirit was not to play with your emotions. The intent of the Holy Spirit was to embrace you into relationship as sons and daughters of who He is. And it didn't change. It didn't change in the book of Acts. It hasn't changed today. Now, I believe in a signs, wonders, and miracles God. I believe God can do whatever God wants to do. I don't put parameters on the Holy Spirit and say, I don't think the Lord... I, I've never believed it was a smart idea to tell God what He couldn't do. <laughs> I've always thought that was really a line you probably shouldn't cross. And I've seen ministries cross it and go, These, the gifts aren't for the church today. God's not doing this anymore because that ended in a certain generation. And I always think, mm, I'm not going to tell... Are you going to be the one that goes and tells God He's not allowed to do that because you don't think it qual people qualify for it? You go for it because I don't believe that I know what it is exactly that God can do. I believe that's God's to do. But I do know that He wants a relationship with humanity and He wants us to know He's our Father. And so I believe the Holy Spirit that Jesus deposited had to be to the same end that Jesus was, which was to get them into that understanding and get them into knowing that relationship. Now, Man, I want to teach 8, 9, 10, 11 tonight because it's so strong on my heart This the Holy Spirit comes to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Um, I, want to, I, I want to read it. How about we do this? I want to read it and let's just see what happens for a few minutes, all right? And, and, and if I go, I might fly through it and then do it fully next week, but I want to at least get a couple things off my heart, really kind of get them off my off my mind. John 16, 8. When he has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. This is probably the most important passage on the role of the Holy Spirit in the church that you will find in the entire Bible. You do not need to go to the book of Acts to figure out the role of the Holy Spirit. 
Go to John 16. It's good to take advice straight from the lips of Jesus. So Jesus says he has a, he has a trifold ministry to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Here's how I think I want to do this. I, I really, I'm going to, I want to break each one of them down, but I want to do that where we seriously have time to do it. So I want to talk about this as sort of a, a, a on an overview to close us out tonight about the, the, the word convict and the role of the Holy Spirit and what he does. And we'll kind of just lead it right up to there. And then, and I think we'll pick it up next week, but I want to, I, w- I really want to just share this with you. This is the only passage in the Bible that connects the Holy Spirit and the verb convict. Don't miss that. This is way bigger than just a passing sentence. This is why I had to get this one out there tonight. All right. And we can, we can stop here this week and we can start here next week and it would be worth it. This is the only passage. Let me repeat that. This is the only passage in the Bible that connects the Holy Spirit and the verb form of convict to where the Holy Spirit is in the process or the action of convicting people. This is it. This is not peripheral. This is not, oh, there's a couple others where Paul, you, this is it. This is the only time we ever get the Holy Spirit doing the act of convicting people. Now, strangely enough, seeing as this is the only time, that's strange because my introduction to the Holy Spirit, and whether you realize it or not, I'm about to prove to you, I think, your introduction to the Holy Spirit was the role of convictor of sin. That's how you met him. And it sounded something like this. You're at church for your first time. I don't care if you're five or you're 50. Here's what you heard. You are a sinner. You were born into sin. You've sinned against God, but Jesus has paid for you. And that thing you feel right now inside of you, that's the convicting power of the Holy Spirit who is convincing you that you're a sinner and that God loves you and that if you would accept Jesus as your Savior, you would be part of the family of God and that feeling you have of conviction would leave because the Holy Spirit wouldn't have anything to convict you of because Jesus would have taken your sins away and you won't feel that again until the next time. They don't tell you this one up front. (laughs) This comes in next week. This is... This is the follow-up sermon next week after you're saved. Now, some of you, I just want to tell you, you've been out here this week sinning, and that feeling you have inside is the convicting power of the Holy Ghost. And if you're, if you're honest, you're in church going, I thought I was supposed to get rid of that. Like last week, I had that same feeling. I went up there and got saved, and I thought I wasn't supposed to feel that way anymore. Go, yeah, but you sinned again. And when you sin, the, so almost all of us in the church were introduced to the Holy Spirit as the sheriff of sin. His entire ministry was the sin hunt. Now, if you have wondered why your friends and your relatives have shied away from the message of grace and the message of the finished work, I just gave you the key. Because our baseline understanding of the Holy Spirit is His one job. I didn't say part of His job. I said His one job is to convict you. Convict you of what? No one, we don't even get past sin. We don't even deal with righteousness and judgment. We just go, job of the Holy Spirit is to convict you of sin. Let me, let me, tell, you, let me tell you how common this is. I, I, I ran a search on this one today. I was just curious. I thought, I'm going to go read an article. I'm going to read one of the first articles that pops up on the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. And so I pop into this article. And this, I promise to God this is what happened in the article. <laughs> Paragraph after paragraph of convicting of sin. And when we got to the next line, and I'll give the dude credit for honesty. He said, I have no idea what conviction of righteousness means. And went back to talking about conviction of sin. Just got to the next, the conviction of righteousness. Admitted it. I'll give him credit. At least they admitted it. I was stunned. I was more shocked they admitted it than that they didn't know anything about it. I don't know what conviction of righteousness. And I thought, how could you not know? Because we've never dealt with the Holy Spirit through any other lens than He 
is the sheriff of sin. He spots sin, can't hide from him. You can put it away, doesn't matter, because the spotlight of the Holy Ghost is going to come find you. Right now, the spotlight of the Holy Spirit is moving down into your heart to find all your sin. And that's exactly what we've thought. Through. Now, you want to know why the message of grace is rejected? The message of finished work is rejected by your friends, by your family? You go, Pastor Paul, why won't they accept it? I'm telling them about how much God loves them, and they're the sons of God, and He's their dad, and I'm using all the verses you give. Because their baseline understanding of the Holy Spirit is that you're wrong because the Holy Spirit is on a sin hunt. And when you go to your family and go, you know, I don't believe Jesus is on a sin hunt, they are convinced you're in false doctrine. Yeah. Yep. Immediately. It doesn't even matter how many verses you have. Because if you don't see the Holy Spirit is on a sin hunt, then what do you think the Holy Ghost is doing if He's convicting the world of sin? They don't even bother with righteous judgment. You don't need it. Because I've asked them to go, what's the scripture where Jesus convicts of sin? And they always take you there. They always take you there to convict the world of sin. Righteousness, judgment, let's don't deal with that. Don't even know how to deal with that. Don't need to deal with that. Convicting of sin's enough because you're doing enough of it and the Holy Spirit's going to come after you for it. <laughs> So it's the only passage in the Bible that connects the Holy Spirit and the verb convict. The Holy Spirit and the verb convict. It is convict is to convince. That's what it means, literally. And the Spirit cannot convince us we are in sin. Why? Because we are in Christ. And therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because you've been released from the law of sin and death and released into the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Because Christ has condemned sin in his flesh. So Jesus paid for my sin, so I receive his righteousness. So the Holy Spirit cannot convince me that I'm in sin because I'm in Christ and therefore I can't be condemned. The law, however, can convict. And I'm going to save that verse We'll start there next week, so I'm going to stop with this thought. I didn't put this on the screen. This is just some of the stuff I've been just wrestled with as we started tonight. People feel bad when they sin, and they call it conviction. I sin, I feel bad, that's the Holy Spirit convicting me. No, it's not. The Holy Spirit can't convince you of sin. The Holy Spirit is here to convince you of your righteousness. That's the next line, by the way. The Holy Spirit convinces of righteousness. There's a danger in going to this point and not going on. We're going to do that next week, but it's just the way it is because there's only so much time. But Jesus uses a certain set of pronouns when he's talking about sin and righteousness. We'll deal with those next week. So, people feel bad when they sin and they call it conviction. It is conviction. It is conviction. It's not Holy Spirit conviction. It's the John 8 conviction. A bunch of guys show up with a woman caught in the act of adultery and they're all holding rocks. And they say, Moses says we should stone her to death. What do you say? And Jesus reaches over and doodles in the sand. He looks up at them and he says, He without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And the Bible says, And they were convicted in their conscience, the oldest to the youngest. And they dropped their rocks and they walked away. They didn't need the Holy Spirit to do it. Your own conscience tells you when you've done something stupid. And I've heard people say, well, lost people sin and they don't ever feel bad about it because they don't have the Holy Spirit. That's a lie. Yeah. Unbelievers do stupid things every day and feel bad about it. And the feeling bad about it puts them under such a weight they end right back up where they were before and do it again. Yeah. We've been lied to too long about what's happening in people as far as conviction is concerned. You want to know why people feel bad when they sin? Because they know there's chaos on the way. They know it. They know there's trouble around the corner and they don't like it and they wish to God they could do something about it and they don't know what to do. And they can't redeem themselves and they can't go get forgiveness. They don't believe in that Jesus or that new creation realities. I say the world lives in perpetual guilt almost constantly and it's not the work of the Holy Spirit. It's no more the work of the Holy Spirit when an unbeliever does it than when a believer does it. The Holy Spirit is not out pointing out the stuff people are doing. All of that has been put into the body of Jesus Christ at Calvary. The Holy Spirit is out introducing people to who Jesus is and what Jesus does. And that's His role. 
We feel bad when we sin, not because the Holy Spirit told us. We feel bad when we sin because we know we hurt somebody. Even an unbeliever. Now you might say, well, they don't feel bad about everything they do. No, because some things haven't been pointed out to them as being wrong. A lot of you didn't feel bad about certain things until you got in church and found out you weren't supposed to do them. And some of the things you got in church and found out you weren't supposed to do was somebody's opinion about what you're not supposed to do. It didn't have anything to do with scripture. It had to do with somebody's version of external holiness. But then you felt bad about it every time you did it, even though you didn't have three scriptures on it. But you still felt bad about it because brother so-and-so said it with such power and fervency. They had an organ behind him and he was sweating and he danced and everybody shouted. So it must be wrong. And so you go out and you live your life and you feel terrible because you do the stuff you were told you weren't supposed to do, even though a day before you went to church, you didn't even know it was wrong. You go, well, see, that's the Holy Spirit convicting me. No, it's not. It's not the Holy Spirit convicting you at all. It's not the, that's not the role of the Holy Spirit. He's your parakletos. He walks alongside of you. He's your helper and your comforter. You shouldn't be scared to death of Him. When you fail, it's not you don't run from the Holy Spirit and go, oh, God, God caught me. You run towards Him. So I have failed, but I know who I am. All right. I have so much more to talk about. But we're going to stop because I went a long time tonight and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up. There's some good, good stuff in our future. Next week on 101, we will deal with the specific roles. Tonight we talked about the work of the Holy Spirit. I think next week we'll title it The Role of the Holy Spirit because they are actually, um, they, it is a subset. It's not just what he's working, but it's the role he has in your life and the role he has in your neighbor's life. And there's so much good and that will allow us then to jump down a little deeper in the text next week. Let's pray, just saturate this word in our spirit with the anointing of the Father as He smears it over in our hearts. We walk away with the idea, the understanding of the, the work of the Spirit. Father, thank You. Thank You. What a beautiful night. What a spectacular experience. You invigorate me. You, you move through me like a charge that provides a, a spark of the divine. And I am so glad that I get to grab hold and ride that. Thank you. I think it's palpable. I think it's not toying with our emotions, but unlocking the door of our heart. Thank you that you have given us the Holy Spirit. Help me with the revelation, and I'm getting there. Help me and this room and all watching with the revelation that it's to our advantage that you went away so that we could have the indwelling presence of the Spirit. Show us what that means. Help us live that out in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.